What if Alt Hist is a mid tier alternate history YouTuber who has the unique attribute that he hates history and refuses to learn any of it? Specifically, he refuses to read any academic history written after 1945 because he thinks that's when history got too woke. One of my biggest interests is anthropology and comparing different civilizations, and you basically have to read books written before the 1960s because people really stopped caring after then. So the sources for his videos are almost exclusively airport bookstore anthropology, overly broad middle grade survey history, and Jordan Peterson knockoffs. The end result is that every video kind of feels like being subjected to a 40-minute lecture from Professor Harold McDougall, the cokehead anthropologist from Red Dead Redemption. We have brought you civilization. I'm sure it hasn't been easy, but it hasn't been easy for anyone, Nastas. Despite this, he gets hundreds of thousands of views and an adoring comment section falling over itself to tell him what a genius he is. Maybe a sampling can explain why. Both of these societies saw declines in religion, growing scale, and massive social problems that had very similar philosophies with ancient Greece having communists. Classical civilization practiced slavery at a truly massive level, so much so that they never really used the steam engine or elementary computers, both of which they invented. If the Russians invade Ukraine without Americans fighting there, they will conquer the country in a matter of weeks. Ukraine can't offer serious resistance. The West's logical views are fundamentally built upon irrational views that come from Christianity, such as the equality of all people. In a society with a strong sense of honor, you can shame people who did dumb things and crass stuff like attend a sexual furry convention or buy NFTs since they are dishonoring their inherent value as human beings. Meanwhile, Rousseau and other thinkers like John Locke, Marx, and the like pushed a populist materialist worldview that empowered the merchant classes. Look at Vietnam and Algeria, where the French and Americans would have won if they kept fighting, but had their populations lose the heart to fight, which in turn caused a downwards of 5 million deaths in Southeast Asia. If Russia screws up, much of the country can be eaten up by the Muslims and the Chinese could populate the East. The European Union really is a nouveau Catholic church, or a moralistic bureaucratic organization that exists to police the continent's regulations. It also has very little real political power. In fact, I can see if the Russians see that they're losing a war to America, cutting a deal with America to turn on China. The Russians have always been kind of slimy, but also extremely effective diplomatically. Europeans are coasting off the achievements of their ancestors, who spent a thousand years building up the continent and now disrespect every institution that got them where they are. A big reason I'm able to be a professional public intellectual is the internet creates a void for higher level reasoning and spitballing to invent new ideas that academia simply blocks due to its misapplication of the idea. Ah. But I want to take a look at a video whose premise is now considered fairly uncontroversial. That baby boomers, the generation born between 1945 and 1964, ruin the world. I have never been entirely comfortable with blaming boomers for all the world's social problems, but I can never exactly articulate why. But this video, this deeply, deeply stupid video, has clarified for me what it is I always found so sinister about boomer bashing. So what's the argument here? What if Alt Hiss doesn't structure his videos in any coherent sequence, so I will, for the sake of brevity, boil it down into 10 premises. Premise 1. The baby boomers were spoiled and parented permissively. The boomers grew up in what could possibly be considered the best era in history. There were so many things that had gone right, it's kinda shocking. The Industrial Revolution had created mass advances in productivity, wages had been kept artificially down for various complicated economic and political reasons in the pre-World War II world, but after the war, the standard of living grew at the fastest level ever in human history. If nothing else, this clarifies that we are talking exclusively about white middle-class Americans. And I'm guessing conditions are similar in Europe. Uh, well, guess again. Premise 2. The baby boomers have no impulse control because of their permissive parenting. The boomer world has posited that pleasure is the purpose of existence, and you see that across the broader society. When you look at 24-7 roadside fast food joints, alongside pop songs with repetitive beats and scantily clad girls, you see the hidden baby boomer conceit that the world has no meaning except pleasure and dopamine hit. Okay, you will never guess what his evidence is that baby boomers have unrefined taste. You can see this in the erosion of the importance of history or philosophy in education, the lack of an idea of high culture, with the boomers eschewing the art, food, literature, and the like that previous eras held in esteem. An example of 
this is the boomers really did not like French food, which was held to be the highest class food in previous eras, and instead replaced it with Italian food, which in America was the food of peasants living in the ghetto. Oh, ho, ho, ho. way. Eat your also buco like a garlic munching troglodyte. I'll be over here, maintaining civilization by eating French food. Wait, what do the French eat these days? Oh, good lord. I'm able to be a professional public intellectual. Premise number three. The baby boomers created the sexual revolution by not being judgmental enough. Nothing could be less cool in the baby boomer generation than in criticizing someone for being too sexually loose, using drugs too much, not honoring their parents, and the other values that society has traditionally pride in order to maintain social unity and survive. Okay, wait. You can accuse baby boomers of a lot, but of failing to impress upon their children that drugs were bad? This is your brain. This is drugs. This is your brain on drugs. Any questions? I mean, they did a better job than their parents. We can see this with sex, in that while the boomers had large amounts of sex, after them, numbers started to collapse. A big reason for this is that free love, when applied, results in low trust strategies like being a fuckboy or being a crazy girl that erode social trust, thus meaning everyone has less sex decades down the line. This lack of sexual regulation has resulted in the boomers being the last real generation of any size in most countries in the world. So the problem with boomers is they have too much sex, which causes everyone else to have not enough sex because having too much sex causes people to act like fuck boys and crazy girls. Are those in the DSM? In the 60s, it was commonly said all you need is love. However, there is no legitimate explanation of what love means, and if a term is that vague, that means there's no way it can be applied in a constructive way. It's... it's a song lyric. Uh, it's a song. How do you extrapolate from- The boomers always say, no one knows what it's like to be the bad man, the sad man behind blue eyes. Which really symbolizes how paralyzed all boomers are by white guilt. I'm able to be a professional public intellectual. Premise 4. The baby boomers created wokeness by being too judgmental and overreacting to the Holocaust. One of the major shifts was the far greater tolerance of all kinds that went with the baby boomers. I think World War II was so horrifying, and the Nazis were so blatantly evil that it made racism untenable. In a traditionally Christian society, one which looked for good and evil, yet wasn't comfortable with morally judging people for their individual actions, they created the Nazis to be the ultimate evil. This has had profound effects in the trajectory of modern society, which has tried to be the exact opposite of the Nazis, of being anti-racist, transnational, pacifist, non-judgmental, and the like. Wait, wouldn't that be the greatest generation's fault, since they're the ones who were traumatized by the war? So, like, boomers were traumatized by reading about the war in books, but the people... Okay. Premise number five. The baby boomers are a pivotal generation, in part because of their narcissistic belief that they are a pivotal generation. One of the very important points to get across about the boomer mentality is that they kind of view themselves as the start of history, in that history as the old world existed ended in World War II, and the boomers are a new generation to teach the world new lessons. Yes, as the great boomer anthem from Billy Joel says, we started the fire. I'm able to be a professional public intellectual. Premise 6. Because of their nihilistic moralism, boomers think the Vietnam War was bad and a big deal, when it was neither. In Europe, the pressure from the baby boomer generation was a big factor pushing decolonization. And whether or not you view that as positive or negative, it greatly weakened the European countries on the international scale for future generations. You see this in the emphasis baby boomers put upon the events that happened in their youth, where for the baby boomers, they view the death of John F. Kennedy, the Vietnam War, and Watergate as truly historic events, but they're not really. America's had previous political scandals, it's had wars, it's had presidents getting shot. The Vietnam War is viewed as impossibly evil by American baby boomers, but I've never had it explained to me why it's functionally any different from Korea, which is widely lauded as a good war that America should have gotten involved in. Both were wars by a northern communist side aggressing against our capitalist southern ally. Well, gee, I don't know. Mister is paid six figures to understand history. Maybe you could learn the answer to that question by reading a book about the Vietnam War. Just, you know, any book. Just any book at all. Just read a book. I'm able to be a professional public intellectual. From a seven. Because of the aforementioned wokeness, boomer foreign policy is based on 
virtue signaling. You can see the boomer mindset in the success of the movie Star Wars. Star Wars is a world divided between a good and an evil faction, the underdogs, and the evil empire, with easy, clean victories. The U.S. has lacked any subtlety in its foreign policy while it's been ruled by boomers. The U.S., under the previous generations, had to manage an extremely complicated Cold War policy, but once the boomers gained electoral power under Reagan, they immediately called the Soviets an evil empire. And after that, in the War on Terror, the U.S. just went full out rather than having a more articulate and subtle policy against terrorism that could have been more effective. This is a foreign policy built off Star Wars rather than reading history or Xenophon. <laughs> Star Wars. <laughs> Damn you, George Lucas. I may have gone too far in a few places. The U.S. allowed China, the country which very obviously has the potential to be our greatest rival, industrialize using our own factory jobs. And it also created Russia as a bogeyman in 2016 when it was pretty clear that Russia was an incredibly weak country, while China was our real rival. And this is because the boomers have trouble constructing a worldview rather than simple good versus evil. Oh Christ. This is an argument you see all the time. You see, if America were less woke, after 1991, it would have immediately committed itself to permanent, open-ended economic warfare against the biggest country on Earth for the explicit purpose of keeping it poor forever. A completely moral and realistic policy that everyone knew how to implement. You can tell because of all the people who suddenly started recommending it in 2016 while claiming it was always what they believed. Can you tell this is a pet peeve? Professional public intellectual. Premise number eight. The baby boomers forced Reagan to do neoliberalism. I don't think it's a surprise that the years when the boomers started to get more influence or the late 70s and early 80s also saw the stagnation of wages in America. The boomers who were able to establish themselves during an era of high wages then went out crushing wages as much as possible as they started to have more capital and thus capital had more value than wages to them for their own economic self-interest. You might think he's onto something here, but have no fear. It immediately gets stupid again when we go to premise number nine. I don't understand monetary policy, and I'm scared of big numbers. Please help. The world today is still positioned for a massive economic recession, inflation, and debt so high it will crush countries, thus leaving the next generation with dire economic conditions. Modern monetary theory, or the dominant economic theory of the Western world today, which basically translates to, we can print as much money as we want and will just magically result in more economic growth, is the perfect encapsulation of the boomer mindset. Oh, of course he's a hyperinflation guy. Of course he is. They all are. Yeah, okay, fine. It'll happen any day now. Jerome Powell is cranking up interest rates at 75 basis points a quarter because he's an MMT guy. Premise number 10. Jane Fonda caused global warming by making the China Syndrome. Another example of this is with the environment, in which baby boomers were unwilling to do anything to deal with carbon emissions, even actively making nuclear energy a near impossible field to research or deal with. This could result in outside environmental damages and serious problems due to climate change down the road. Uh, this is basically true. No notes. QED. Boomers destroyed society by creating a hyper-moralistic, non-judgmental regime of live-and-let-live authoritarianism. Like everything else the boomers did, a short-term massive gain resulted in long-term decay and degeneracy. The pattern of the boomers being unwilling to enforce any sense of order, thus resulting in social collapse, is omnipresent in our society. Without social regulations, we saw the declines in social connections, number of friends, the skyrocketing of mental health problems, the collapse in social trust, skyrocketing divorce rate. And you could go across the broader society, everything from more unhealthy fast food, worst quality movies, worst quality road systems, and that the boomers were totally unwilling to maintain the broader level of social function. And by destroy society, I mean instituted a moderately sized structural budget deficit and being gay is legal. I'm able to be a professional public intellectual. So I guess the first question to ask here is, were baby boomers spoiled? There are always perennial complaints about the next generation being spoiled, but the idea has clung to boomers even as they reached old age in a way that's rare. This isn't for no reason. This idea has a surprisingly interesting history. In 1946, Dr. Benjamin Spock wrote The Common Sense Guide to Baby and Child Care. The book represented an attempt to create a more practical and evidence-based guide to child rearing and dispel many of the weird superstitions and old wives tales that had dominated child rearing advice up till then. The book was an instant success and made Dr. Spock into an instant celebrity. You, this is hypothetical, of course, but you as much as say in your book, at two months and two months, uh, two years and two months, 
uh, your child will pick up the crayons, head for the wall, and scribbled all over. And to the day, the child picks up the crayons, goes to the wall, and, and you sit there in a minute and say, that son of a gun, Dr. Spock. How do you know that? But then you're prepared for the future. That's amazing. Well, I give lots of leeway, you know. I, I set those different things for relatively dull children. <laughs> so... <laughs> I'm going right home after the show and beat him up. <laughs> Nor was it particularly controversial for its time, but flash forward 20 years later and Dr. Spock has begun using his influence in a more dangerous way. What I don't believe in is the United States being the great aggressor as it is in Southeast Asia and then trying to pretend that we're doing that to protect that part of the world against communism. That is paranoia! He's palling around with Martin Luther King Jr. and organizing marches to end the Vietnam War. You have to understand, it was one thing for college kids or black leaders to criticize the government, but for the man who was almost the prototype of white old male authority figure to go around saying that actually the hippies were right about the war, that was uniquely dangerous. In 1968, the government tried to have him sent to prison for conspiring to resist the draft. But when that failed, the Nixon administration decided to try and kill two birds with one stone, discredit both Spock and the war protesters. Nixon's vice president, Spiro Agnew, began blaming not Dr. Spock's anti-war activism for the anti-war sentiment among the young, but instead blaming his baby book for the hippie scourge. He alleged that baby and childcare advocated permissiveness, and that therefore Spock had created an entire generation of college kids too coddled and impulsive to just listen to their betters explain to them why Vietnam needed to be napalmed. It was a neat rhetorical trick, saying that the protesters' radical actions came not from the moral urgency of the situation, but rather was the result of emotional immaturity. It had the minor disadvantage of not being true. Spock wasn't even against corporal punishment, let alone discipline in general. But the accusation stuck and has been passed down as lore from generation to generation of right-wing culture warriors. So an accusation hurled at baby boomers by their parents for their unwillingness to see non-whites as subhuman is now hurled at them by their children for America's rising inequality. I don't think it's a surprise that the years when the boomers started to get more influence or the late 70s and early 80s also saw the stagnation of wages in America from which they would never recover. But that brings us to a more important question. Are boomers responsible for today's inequality? What if Altis breezes through the question of policy? But he does briefly mention immigration. Starting with the Reagan revolution, America started mass importing immigrants by the millions. Presumably meaning the Immigration and Nationality Act, but that law was passed in 1965, before any baby boomer was even old enough to vote. Baby boomers have mostly overseen increasingly draconian attempts to curb illegal immigration. That leaves economic policy, and this is where what if all his argument converges with the history you more commonly hear from left-wing millennials. The idea that baby boomers started out as left-wing idealists, but then upon hitting their 30s, they sold out and became good Reaganites. And this story, I'm sorry to tell you, is fake. The sad truth is that baby boomers were never all that left-wing to begin with. They were more left-wing than the generation that came before and after them, but not by a lot. And they stayed that way all through their lives. In fact, if you look at election returns from every year from 1976 on, what you see is that age correlates very little to how people voted, right up until 2004, when young people suddenly veer hard to the left. That's right, the person most responsible for bringing back youthful radicalism is none other than John Kerry. I'm John Kerry, and I'm reporting for duty. Somehow, simultaneously, the most and least ironic person to do it. So, where are people getting this? Well, in our friend's case, we can know for sure, because unlike in most of his videos, this one has a source. A Generation of Sociopaths by Bruce Gibney. And who is Bruce Gibney? A sociologist? A psychologist? An anthropologist? Nope. He's Peter Thiel's lawyer a personal retainer to Silicon Valley's Nazi vampire overlord. And giving it a quick look, you see a lot of right-wingers taking this line. The American Enterprise Institute, Reason Magazine, uh, 
Gavin McInnes. They also invented feminism. That's number four. The baby boomers invented this thing where women are men, where Sally Fields is smoking a cigar and Burt Reynolds is doing knitting. This man successfully created a cult based around masculinity. Just remember that whenever you feel imposter syndrome coming along. Thanks, bitches. What's going on here? I think two things. First, it's blame displacement. The budget deficit was first and foremost the result of the Reagan and Bush tax cuts. Climate change denial is a platform of the current Republican Party. The Iraq War was started by Republicans. The financial crisis was caused by conservatives gutting financial regulations. We are here today to repeal Glass-Steagall because we have learned that government is not the answer. Putting all these changes on the impulsiveness of a generational cohort helps people ignore the ideology that pushed those policies and instead focuses on a demographic that you can then subtly equate with the opposition. Second is entitlements. The country's first baby boomer gets her first social security check. But don't call her an old timer. The right has invested a lot of money in trying to convince people that social security is going to run out of money and that millennials shouldn't even expect to get Social Security by the time they're old. Over the next 20 years, almost 80 million baby boomers will become eligible for Social Security. But what about Generations X and Y? Some experts say they could be out of luck. Research shows the nation's trust fund will begin paying out more in benefits than it collects in payroll taxes in 2017, and the fund may be empty by 2041. What does the word Ponzi scheme mean? A Ponzi scheme is a system. If you and I cooked up a Ponzi scheme, we would have current people pay into it. Right. We would take the money and we would pay it out to other recipients. That's the definition of a Ponzi scheme. Right. In the English language, that is exactly how Social Security is. So I'm going to take that as a yes, that you believe that Social Security is a Ponzi scheme. I think... Now, this is not true. Even if payroll tax funding of Social Security was anything other than a meaningless accounting gimmick, putting the Social Security Fund back in the black could be done fairly painlessly by just raising the payroll tax cap. But that would mean taking money from rich people. So conservatives would prefer to solve the problem by cutting Social Security. Raised. Do you believe it is no longer the case that Social Security is the third rail of American politics and you can't touch it? Or are you simply advising your fellow Republicans and your fellow executives to take a stand that may be, that you believe may very well be politically fatal? See, I think the world has changed and I don't believe it's fatal. I don't. In fact, I think you're going to be rewarded for courage. But I think if folks believe that they have a group of leaders who are going to say to them, this is what's necessary, it's a mathematical equation, it needs to be done, and I suspect when it comes to convincing young people to cut benefits for old people, it's useful to have a narrative about how the evil older generation ruined everything for you millennials and Zoomers. In fact, if you look at Bruce Gibney's book, you will even see the evil sociopath boomer is made out of torn up social security cards. Very subtle. So what's the moral here? Well, uh, you know, don't fall for this. Boomers didn't ruin the world. Generation X did. Just kidding, it's neoliberalism. And shout out to my patrons. Dustin Lockwood, Iroquois Pliskin, James Lynch, Cullen, Selma Pussy, Bernth, Aki665, Valint Kovach, Old Drippy, Bruce Reinhard, Ananas, Taboon, Zoo Beers, Dr. Chad Guevara, Jason Yance, Watch the anime Cat Planet Cuties, no, that's good broth. Ari and I, Red Fox, Rob Field, Garpenlov, Armin Hindenburg, Telks V, Carl Neo, B. Quinn, Sir S, Sean Oscar, Foldout Chair, Joel Gomez, Gabo Tsai, Scott Beckett, Zach Christensen, Horse Course, Ryan Refner, Knowing Better, Nate Rice, Tedsville, Kimma Berry, Boaterman, Aaron, Foggeiten, Jacob Lisi, Big Nove, Elia, Diana Banana, and Kitten of the Yarn Persuasion. Um, as you see, the boomers, they always say, baby, we were born to run, showing how they viewed it as permissible to run away from all their problems. 
Well, you see, the boomers like to say, who killed the Kennedys when after all, it was you and me, when I hadn't even been born when Kennedy was assassinated. This just shows how boomers like to blame other people for their problems. You see, in Space Oddity, Major Tom died. That's why boomers underfund NASA. <laughs> I can't. No, I can do better one than that. Wait, all right, let me think. Boomers like to say, imagine all the people living for today, which just shows how depraved and secularized their generation. No, that sounds too much like a real one. Like he probably believes that. Hold on. You see, boomers like to say, we are the champions of the world, regardless of whether they've actually won a competition. Just showing why they gave their kids participation <laughs> trophies. <laughs> this is so stupid. I can't keep these. Premise four, the baby